The dawn of X Wave 1 is complete. Today, I'll answer what we've learned so far about X-Men comics in the post-House of X Krakoa era. Where the dawn of X has succeeded and failed to live up to the promise of House and Powers of Ten. And do you need to read the entire dawn of X to understand what's going on? Which titles are the most vital? And I'll tease a part two where I explore theories about where Dawn of X is going in Wave 2 and beyond. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You are listening to Kraken Krakoa number 34, the podcast and YouTube channel where I explain and explore the X-Men comics of 2020 and beyond. If you like CBH YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Links to CBH channels and Patreon support are included in the show notes. You can find full X-Men and comic book reading orders on ComicBookHerald.com, and spoilers for all discussed comics may follow Let's talk Dawn of X. Why look back at the Dawn of X now? Well, we've reached the point where all six launch titles, X-Men, Marauders, X-Force, New Mutants, Excalibur, and Fallen Angels, have released at least six issues, which doubles as the total number of issues in each of their first collected trade paperbacks. Likewise, this week marks, marks Marvel's release of their first Dawn of X hardcover collection, a series of collected editions that will include one issue from each series for a total of six stories. So effectively, we have 36 issues, 6 full story arcs, even if some, like X-Men, are intentionally far from conclusive, and about 4 months of real-world time passing since Powers of Ten number 6 wrapped the game-changing X-Men event of 2019. It's more than enough to summarize what's happened, what's working, what's not, and where Jonathan Hickman and company might be taking the X-Men. The overarching theme of Dawn of X, across all six launch titles, is actually the X-Men number six issue title, Something's Not Right. It's all about foreboding dark clouds on the horizon, even as the nation of Krakoa is newly established and appears to be a kind of paradise for mutants in the Marvel Universe. Whether it's internal, the Hellfire Club power plays in Marauders, or external, Orcus's continuing sentinel experiments in the pages of X-Men, threats are everywhere for the collective X-Men and friends. Big picture, this has generated a strong tension between mutants adjusting to their new place in the world and the familiar fear and hate they've been subjugated to all their lives. Execution varies across titles, and yes, I'll share which ones I think are most vital, but they all generally fit this theme. Can mutants ever truly escape the problems of their past? Will the Krakoan dream transcend the barriers that have impeded mutants at every turn throughout history? The clearest indicator that the Dawn of X would not be reveling in the newfound utopia no, not that utopia, came in X-Force number one. We here had the assassination of Professor Xavier on the island of Krakoa while wearing the Cerebra helmet, which allows him to connect with all of mutant kind. This was a very bold opening issue choice. Like any violent, shocking event, the speed with which X-Force number one ripped mutants out of the House of X afterglow, and it was upsetting and frustrating, I think, at the same time time. Nonetheless, the message was very clear. Things are not going to be easy on Krakoa. In interviews prior to Dawn of X, writer Jonathan Hickman made it clear that the death of mutants could not be used as the overused comics trope death has become, quote-unquote death, since Superman died back in 1993. With Krakoa's resurrection protocols, readers know that almost always mutants can be brought back from death. The challenge of the Dawn of X is to invent creative ways to challenge this get-out-of-afterlife-free card. Likewise, given the short-lived nature of a death, there has to be much broader purpose than simply taking a character off the board. In the case of X-Force number one, the message was clear. Despite the X-Men's newfound domination on the global stage, there will always be inventive, destructive humans seeking to literally blow up their plans. X-Force has followed this theme looking at various global threats to Krakoan dominance. There are familiar threats like Xeno, an anti-mutant resistance army loaded with mutant-dampening power technology, and their own cybernetic biological weaponized enhancements, as well as perhaps some cloning tech. More recently, there are human-plant hybrids and pharmaceutical marketplace squabbles intertwined with X-Force's own covert operations. Naturally, as we saw in House and Powers, when humans feel threatened or others feel threatened by mutants and their evolutionary escalation or seeming takeover, the fear of extinction generates these types of inventions for dastardly doings. Meanwhile, in the Hickman-written X-Men, there are a lot of spinning plates, again with threats both internal and external. Given Hickman's work writing, X-Men is without question the most essential narrative following House of X, even if Marauders and X-Force have both at times felt more like the center of the X-Men Dawn of X universe. But through six issues, it has been anything but linear. Purely in chronological order, to date, we've seen the following threats emerge. 
First up, the Children of the Vault. This is actually the only threat we've seen Hickman and company return to so far in the first six issues of X-Men, where they were teased very briefly in the first issue of the book, and in X-Men number five, the Children of the Vault were explored in significantly more detail. I've, of course, uh, recapped these in Crack and Krakoa series, but suffice it to say, the Children of the Vault are parallels with mutant kind they have advanced uh, in some technically different ways through temporal shifts and all sorts of tech that everybody should go back and read the mike carey chris bacala run of x-men number 192 to 197 to explore but they are what charles xavier has deemed the greatest threat to mutant kind we also have orcus the orcus threat thought crippled in house of x number four these are the you know the clear baddies out in space humankind building sentinels for the purpose of destructing mutants and in the house and powers event there was that whole big sequence where a bunch of mutants go to the moon or go to this base in space to destroy the mother mold that they believed would be building a nimrod now in x-men number six we've seen some some new information here that might change the game but regardless we've already seen orcas returning in number six as well building sentinels building a sentinel city i believe on mars potentially and all sorts of operations that are of course a danger to mutant kind we also have the development of Arako and whatever's going on there with apocalypse in his first horseman this is all sort of supernatural and and still somewhat mysterious but we know that krakoa when it was young when it was birthed essentially uh was a you know it was a shared island with Arako, which is basically the island nation's sibling and that they were separated up until a moment in x-men number two where they come together but Arako has some sort of wild war going on there are summoners and beings that we don't know a whole lot about at this point and a lot more information to come there throughout the hickman run we also have flippin' horde culture, <laughs> the weirdest and wildest turn of not only the Hickman X-Men comics, but probably all of the Dawn of X. These are octogenarian, uh, bio no, not biologists, botanists that are uh, working against mutant kind and uh, made Sebastian Shaw look like a fool. So it was a very weird, very funny issue, but also a, a like mind-numbing left turn that will almost certainly have to be worked back into the story of X-Men. We also have your standard great human assassination plots. Of course, in X-Men number four, an issue I really, really love, talked about as the best issues of Hickman's X-Men to date. You know, this was all about Magneto, Professor X, and Apocalypse traveling to the United Nations um, or traveling to have, you know, United Nations-style talks with, with dignitaries, foreign dignitaries and leaders as the island, the newly established government island nation of Krakoa, and basically making their presence and their plans known, trying to both uh, intimidate, but also to, I think, establish relations with other world governments. And then finally, just most recently in X-Men number six, we've seen Mystique and Destiny arrive as a major threat, at least to the plans of um, Professor X, Magneto, and Moira. You know, we have Charles and Magneto constantly moving the goalposts on Mystique. They've promised her to return her wife, Destiny, back to her through resurrection protocols, but every time she comes and asks, they insist she does another chore, another errand for mutant kind, and that is just not going to suffice for too long, I have to think, before Mystique takes action. In the pages of Marauders, we mirror the blend of these, again, internal and external threats. Internally, we have Sebastian Shaw. He is a council member per Professor X and Magneto's request of Emma Frost, a council member of Krakoa, but he's playing his own power struggle games, right? Trying to establish more of his own people on the council, establishing uh, seats at the table, essentially, for his own personal gain. We also see um, we see Navy monitoring the actions of the Marauders' sailing vessel. We see nations across the globe blocking their Krakoan gates to keep mutants from getting to them for political and, and devious reasons, of course. And we also see, externally, Hominus Verendi, which is the return of the Hellfire Kids back from Jason Aaron written Wolverine and X-Men run, which started, I think, around 2011. These are young, villainous... <laughs> they seem like children, but don't let that fool you. They are quite evil, and they are setting out to, to destroy mutant kind as well. Um, so they've enlisted the aid of absolute evil villains like the Hatemonger, a.k.a. the literal reincarnation of 
of Adolf Hitler. Um, and they also seem to have a spy, we've learned in the pages of Marauders recently, infiltrating Krakoa so they can learn its many secrets, at least to them. Meanwhile, in Excalibur, the threats are literally otherworldly, although even then we're seeing the British government get involved with concerns that the newly established mutant Captain Britain, this would be Betsy Braddock, uh, is, you know, she may, they fear she may be too loyal to Krakoa, that in the, the event of a Britain versus Krakoa, Krakoa war or struggle, you know, whose side would Captain Britain be on? So there's some politics at play, but, you know, most prominently, there's Apocalypse leading a group of Betsy Braddock and Gambit and Rogue and, and Jubilee and Richter, um, you know, to Otherworld where Morgan Le Fay has taken over. So there's a whole magic element. Uh, but the part that I find really interesting is this idea of, like, alternate dimension, alternate realm conquest and Krakoa accessing those realms as well and then finally in the pages of fallen angels uh we have apoth this very mysterious uh sort of mythological figure and and he is doing something with new illegal drugs that could perhaps rival the krakoan marketplace so those are the threats Actually, there's one more. New Mutants is the strangest Dawn of X title to summarize because it's effectively two distinct stories in one title, with Jonathan Hickman and Rod Rice telling a story about the traditional New Mutants lineup in Shi'ar space, and Ed Brisson and Fleviano telling a story about some New Mutants running into drug dealers in the American heartland. There's, in the, you know, the Hickman-written issues with Rod Rice, there are galactic implications being discussed. There are, you know, there's this idea of, okay, Krakoa is a newfound established government and nation on Earth. But what does that mean for their relationship with alien civilizations like the Shi'ar? That's very, very interesting to to discuss. And then in the Ed Brisson written issues, we have, you know, a literal drug dealer cartel from Costa Perdida, this nation where Krakoan drugs are are drastically needed, right? So Krakoa says, hey, we have this medicine for you. We have these drugs. They'll, you know, give you five more years of life or cure Alzheimer's or whatever the, the cures they're promising. And you have this, you know, cartel saying we can, if we get these drugs, you know, we can make millions and millions of dollars, right? So they become extremely, extremely um, in demand for, you know, like really across the globe, just because the X-Men or Professor X rather said they're available doesn't mean everyone can actually get at them. Through all these books, we've learned that the Krakoa era will not be devoid of drama or tension of a new um, and that the mere declaration of a new status quo does not cure the deep seated hate some have for mutant kind. Not only will the Krakoan happy party times not be easy, but they're far from assured. It's easy to overlook because it was so transformative, but House of X and Powers of Ten were truly just the beginning. There's a lot of work to be done to see mutant kind's vision actualized in the way that, of course, the leaders are hoping for. So where have the comics of Dawn of X succeeded or failed to live up to the promise of House of X and Powers of Ten? On average, I'd argue the Dawn of X has a fairly high batting average, but it's certainly not perfect. What was I looking for? for Dawn of X to do in the wake of Howard's House and Powers. It's one thing to say the vision hasn't matched up to the potential, but without defining that promise, it's a fairly hollow criticism. So here's what I was looking for. Exploring the logistics of Krakoa in the broader Marvel Universe, digging into the lifelines of Moira X and the futures we saw in Powers of X. How is Krakoa changing the game to ensure mutants don't always lose, as Myra puts it? I'll just say right now that this piece has absolutely not happened, so I'll save discussion until I get to what's on the horizon for some theories about X-Men books in 2020. And finally, tell stories that could only happen in a post-Krakoa era. This one's particularly important to me. Regarding Krakoa's place in the Marvel Universe, Marauders, X-Force, and X-Men, particularly issue number four, all add details to this very well. Unsurprisingly, they're also my favorite books. Marauders deliberately make sense within the confines of Krakoa. Kate, pride, she can't use the gates. She formula, has to formulate a team to help global mutants get to their own gates. Likewise, all of Sebastian Shaw's Hellfire Club machinations are in order to control shipment of Krakoan medicine. It's a premise that simply does not exist in conditions that aren't post-house and post-powers. In X-Men number 4, Magneto gives a speech defining mutant kind's non-violent, well, mostly, plans to take control of the globe. Again, this does not exist outside of the context 
of the Kirk Cohen era, where you have Magneto and, you know, basically being the mouthpiece for Professor X and potentially Myra's vision of them saying, we're just going to take control of all your power structures. And as he says, there will be no war, which is a very atypical Magneto line. Typically, he thinks war first. We see in the Myra lifelines in powers that there was a great Magneto war in one of those. But here, you know, there is the learning that that's not what's actually going to work here in terms of mutant kind really taking over. X-Force ties in in a number of ways, such as ruined rival countries and the collapse of their big pharma economic dreams. Likewise, we get data pages showcasing Professor X's financial portfolio and all the ways he's warping the world to share a mutant vision. I won't give X-Force 100% credit here for being sort of forward-thinking and only in the Krakoa era. I did think the reformation of X-Force as a concept uh, felt very much uh, backwards-thinking, actually, in a lot of ways, because we've seen you know, that sort of exact scenario a number of times throughout X-Men history, definitely in the past decade, where something bad happens and the X-Men then say, we need a task force that can do the things, that commit the violent acts and the theft and the, you know, espionage that the rest of the X-Men can't. And X-Force definitely has those elements, but, you know, it's doing enough with the new Krakoan landscape to be celebrated. The other piece is telling stories that could only happen in a post krakoa era. And this has been one of my biggest criticisms of both Fallen Angels and Excalibur both of which certainly reference the X-Men status quo, but still feel like mediocre to poor comics that could have surfaced any other time this millennium. I think that's one of the hardest things to get over for me is just the idea of, you know, in Fallen Angels, the idea of Quanon back in her original body or her true body, you know, now operating as Psylocke in, in the X-Men universe, that story could happen any time. There's, there's really nothing specific about that to a post Krakoan landscape. Likewise, the idea of Betsy Braddock, you know, taking over the Captain Britain mantle, first off, not even the first time that's ever happened. Um, the idea of the Braddocks, you know, struggling to like retake Otherworld, also not super new. <laughs> like that is, that's kind of Excalibur 101 type stuff. I think all of Apocalypse's machinations and the fact that you tie him into that and, and everything he's doing with magic is interesting. But again, I don't know, at least yet, that it's super specific to this new era of X-Men. And for me, that's kind of held it back. With all that in mind, do you need to read the entire Dawn of X to understand what's going on? Which titles are the most vital? As much as I love the idea and am actively cataloging a proper reading order for every X-Men comic on Comic Book Herald, the idea of an extremely tightly woven tapestry of X continuity is not quite reality. So far, the biggest reference points from books that branch out and affect X, other X titles are Professor X's Assassination in X-Force Number 1, The New Mutant Space Odyssey, The Professor's Resurrection, and The Apparent Assassination of Kate Pride in Marauders Number 6. This event has actually created one of the Dawn's first chronology mess-ups, or cross-ups, I should say, as it means X-Men Fantastic Four Number 1, the kickoff of Wave 2 in a book prominently featuring Kate, has to occur earlier in the timeline than purely following the release date of these comics. Again, you can find a link to that reading order in the show notes. Otherwise, though, the books are relatively self-contained, meaning you can stick to the titles you most enjoy, and only the most dedicated X-Men fans truly have reason to keep up with everything. When you're a continuity-obsessed fan like myself, this is easier said than done. But I'll admit, my list of what's vital doubles as a list of my favorites. X-Men, Marauders, X-Force, New Mutants. I think if you're reading all of those, you are in very good shape to understand what has happened, what's going on, and what's good about X-Men Dawn of X through its first, you know, story arcs. Next time on Comic Book Herald's Crack and Krakoa in the Dawn of X Wave 1 Part 2, I'll share theories about what's next, rank the upcoming new X-Men titles, and list out the 12 biggest hanging threads from House of X in the Dawn that I can't wait to see answered in 2020. If you have thoughts, theories of what's to come, um, things that you really want to see answered that were teased in any of the Dawn of X Wave 1 or House and Powers as well, I'd love to hear from you. You can either comment here on the YouTube channel, or of course you can find me anywhere at Comic Book Herald online, on social, or just go on over to comicbookherald.com, and you can find all of the great analysis that we're doing over there and share some of your thoughts as well. Thanks, everybody, for listening. It was a lot of fun. Been talking X-Men through uh, this you know, house event and now the Dawn of X Wave 1. I look forward to continuing to do it into the future, and I look forward to hearing much, much more from all of you. So thanks for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.